These are the 17 victims of the shooting on February 14th at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I wanted to start this video by showing you the reality of gun violence, and I hope you keep these faces and these lives in mind throughout the video. This discussion has real-world consequences, and too often in the debate we get lost in the hypotheticals that obfuscate the real tragedies, the tragedies that befell these 17 people. What I'm hoping to do here is to take a look at the realities of gun violence in the United States. In the interest of full disclosure, I should mention that I am a Canadian citizen and I was born in Canada, so in no way am I an American. Or at least I'm certainly not an American citizen. I don't believe this invalidates any of the information I'm presenting, but I should acknowledge that I'm coming at this from a perspective. That said, as someone who doesn't particularly like guns, I want to understand why. When shootings like this happen, nothing is ever done to prevent them from happening again. At least nothing is ever done by the political class. The shooting in Parkland, Florida was initially reported as the 18th school shooting so far in 2018. There was some controversy surrounding this number immediately after its reporting, with claims of misrepresentation as the figure of 18 doesn't necessarily represent what comes to mind when we think of school shootings. Rather, it's a measure of gun-related violence happening on school grounds. I'm not sure 18 counts of gun violence happening on school grounds is much comfort, but it does give us a number to start with, and there are plenty more sad gun stats to be found. These maps from gunviolencearchive.org detail some of the other incidents of gun violence in 2018 so far in the United States. This is a map of the total number of deaths, this one, the total number of teenagers killed by firearms, and this is a map of children killed by firearms. Each of those little red dots does a disservice to the individual stories. Each of them was one of those faces we saw at the beginning of this video. Responses to tragedies like the one in Parkland can lead to some truly dreadful hot takes. There are the usual blatherings of the internet's dregs, but I'd rather look at the response from first-time Alabama State Representative Will Ainsworth, proposing legislation to allow teachers to carry concealed weapons. If a teacher, an administrator, a coach, um, a principal would like to actually be armed, they can go through a training process. Uh, it's going to be an A-post training process, the same process we use for law enforcement, and then they can actually carry a firearm in the school system. And a sentiment recently echoed by the president. Ainsworth noted that laws for gun control, in his opinion, don't need to be changed. Of course, it should be noted that there was an armed guard on the grounds of the Parkland High School, and it did nothing to deter the shooter. Ainsworth and his ilk present a pressing danger to American society. The willingness of the political class to do anything but touch the status of guns in the United States. In my opinion, it's evil people that actually are doing the damage, not the guns. We can't really understand gun violence in the United States completely without real scientific inquiry into the subject something that American elected officials have been fighting against for decades, refusing to grant the CDC permission to research gun violence in the United States. That research was first blocked due to a 1996 amendment by Jay Dickey, an Arkansas Republican who served four times in the U.S. House of Representatives. He butted heads with Mark Rosenberg, head of the CDC at the time, and upon winning that fight, Dickey put an end to any attempt by the CDC to research gun violence in the United States. However, the dialogue between Dickey and Rosenberg continued over the years, and eventually Rosenberg convinced Dickey of the importance of researching gun violence. In 2012, long after Dickey had left Congress, Dickey and Rosenberg wrote a joint essay for the Washington Post urging new research into gun violence. In a 2015 interview with the Huffington Post, former Representative Dickey said, I wish we had started the proper research and kept it going all this time. I have regrets. And later in the same interview, he said, If we had somehow gotten the research going, we could have somehow found a solution to the gun violence without there being any restrictions on the Second Amendment. We could have used all those years to develop the equivalent of that little small fence. Former Representative Dickey passed away in 2017. There was an attempt to lift the CDC research ban in 2012 when President Obama issued an executive order and called for $10 million to be spent on research following the deaths of 20 children and 6 adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. 
Unfortunately, Congress never appropriated those funds, and the only results of the research are a meta-review of the literature that draws no new conclusions and points to areas of research that need to be done. Gun rights activists have held this up as a victory of sorts, with spurious claims that the published paper has somehow proven gun control cannot work. The paper published by the CDC is titled, Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm-Related Violence. While the title basically explains itself, I'm going to go ahead and read the conclusion of the paper so you can get an idea of what its purpose truly was. The research agenda proposed in this report is intended as an initial, not a conclusive or all-encompassing, set of questions critical to developing the most effective policies to reduce the occurrence and impact of firearm-related violence in the United States. No single agency or research strategy can provide all the answers. This report focuses on the public health aspects of firearm violence. The committee expects that this research agenda will be integrated with research conducted from criminal justice and other perspectives to provide a much fuller knowledge base to underpin our nation's approach to dealing with this very important set of societal issues. Regardless of that conclusion, you'll find plenty of articles, such as this one from Guns and Ammo penned by Kyle Winterstein, that present this research paper as some kind of knockdown argument against gun control, with cherry-picked sentences and misrepresentative quotes claiming access to guns is somehow not linked to gun violence. As an example, the Winterstein article drops a line like this, Defensive uses of guns are common, and now quoting the research paper, Almost all national survey estimates indicate that defensive gun uses by victims are at least as common as offensive uses by criminals, with estimates of annual uses ranging from 500,000 to more than 3 million per year, in the context of about 300,000 violent crimes involving firearms in 2008. So Winterstein is trying to tell you that somewhere between 500,000 and 3 million people use guns in self-defense every year. Now does this statistic seem odd to you? If there are 3 million instances of someone using guns defensively in a year, that works out roughly to 1 out of 108 people. If you're an American who knows at least 108 people, ask yourself how many of these people have used a gun defensively. You should know, on average, one person who's done that for each year you've been alive. These numbers come from research done by Gary Kleck at Florida State University, and it uses unconfirmed reports of people using guns to stop criminal offenses. In a similar line of inquiry, the National Crime Victimization Survey was conducted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and it found that the number of individuals who used guns defensively in confirmed criminal incidents is a much more conservative number of 65,000 individuals, a far cry from the higher total of 3 million. Not that I'm, of course, trying to besmirch the good names of guns and ammo, but I believe they might be a bit biased in this case. In spite of that block on research for the CDC, there has been some science done on how gun control impacts gun violence. In one meta-analysis published in 2016 titled, What Do We Know About the Association Between Firearm Legislation and Firearm-Related Injuries by Julian Santella Tenorino of Columbia University and their associates, they found that when looking at 130 studies across 10 countries, specifically looking at gun control legislation and its effects, found that restricting access and purchase of firearms was related to a decrease in firearm-related injury and death. It should also be noted that another key finding of this paper is that more research into this topic would be highly beneficial in informing future policy-making decisions. I'm not presenting the paper above as a final say in research on gun violence. Science doesn't really work that way. Instead, I would sooner say that we need more research, not less, and that there are enough models on reasonable gun control in other countries that could be used in the United States to reduce gun violence, from the robust background checks of countries like Germany to the outright banning of certain guns in the UK and Japan. In the wake of the Parkland shooting, scientists from the CDC are pleading to be allowed to do more research on gun violence. I'll leave it to the judgment of my viewers as to why the US government is so committed to preventing this research from happening. There are a number of counter-arguments to gun control, ranging from the absurd to seemingly reasonable. I want to touch on one of the better ones, and by better I don't necessarily mean good. Take this article published by the NRA. It looks at some research by Philip J. Cook, Susan T. Parker, and Harold A. Pollock that examines where criminals get their guns. There's no author name for this NRA article, but presumably it comes from one of their internal organs. 
The article claims that the 2015 study by Cook et al. affirms the common talking point of criminals being able to get guns regardless of regulations put in place to prevent just that. In this specific case, they're arguing against background checks. The NRA article is courageous enough to note that the conclusion is extrapolated from the research, but not actually found in the study. The NRA article reads, Of course, the authors refuse to offer the obvious conclusions many will draw from their results. Expanding background checks would have no impact on the criminal acquisition of guns, since these criminals do not use gun stores, gun shows, or even legal private gun sellers. There is no point in the criminal supply chain where a background check would make any difference whatsoever. The NRA article doesn't address where the criminals get their guns, of course, because that would pierce the fiction of criminals obtaining them from some sort of shady source, presumably fairies or whatever the NRA imagines guns come from. The Cook study clearly describes that 70% of the guns used by the criminals were obtained through their social network. In other words, friends and family. The obvious follow-up question is, where do those people get their guns? Before getting into that answer, you should know that this survey was done in Chicago, which is an outlier to most American cities having stricter gun laws, and this survey was conducted by asking 99 inmates where they happened to obtain their firearms, and they said a lot more than they just got it from a friend. The Cook study actually offers four different answers to where the guns come from, and ordered from most common answer to least, Guns are legally purchased by someone with a firearms owner identification card and then distributed to others. People will go into another state, Indiana is usually cited, and buy guns there. Guns may be stolen. Guns are sometimes obtained from police officers. Here's one response in particular that was highlighted in the study that answered the question, where do you get your guns? Several ways, actually. There's probably only one gun store that's located throughout the whole city of Chicago, which is famous. It's Chuck's Gun Store. But as far as Chicago, it's so close to Indiana, and in Indiana, there's gun laws, but it's easier to get access to guns in Indiana, so most people either go to the down south states or go to Indiana to get guns. Or people obtain gun licenses, go to the store, and then resell. So these guns aren't magically appearing in the hands of criminals. In most cases, they are being legally purchased from places with weak gun laws. This is the reality of how lax gun laws don't have borders. And guns aren't just limited by state borders, they can cross federal ones too. Canada's gun laws are incredibly strict, and in a similar pattern as to what's happening in Chicago, guns are being smuggled from places where it's easier to obtain them. In this case, the United States. This CBC article highlights how guns are smuggled into Canada from the U.S. in cars and boats. According to Sergeant Chris O'Brien, an Ottawa police officer, 60% of guns used in crimes in Ontario are obtained in the United States, particularly from southern states with looser gun laws. Unless you think Canadians are the only one affected by this, the lax gun laws of the United States also have an impact on Mexico. In a 2016 report by the U.S. Government Accountability Office, they found of all the guns used in criminal activity seized by the Mexican government between 2009 and 2014, 70%, that's over 73,000 guns, originated from the United States. The report continues to say that these guns were legally purchased at dealers and gun shows and then put in the hands of criminals. The report also highlights how the cartels in Mexico preferred the high-powered rifles, which are more easily purchased in the United States. There are two quick addendums I want to include in this, though. That 70% figure of firearms only includes those seized by the Mexican government that were subjected to a trace. It doesn't mean that it was 70% of all guns total that were seized by the Mexican government, so the number of 73,000 guns coming from the United States could, in fact, be even higher. Also, it should be noted that drug cartels like using other weapons such as rocket launchers, grenades, and other types of heavy military ordnance, and that these are all obtained from old weapon stockpiles found in Central American countries. So the fact that they're only getting pistols and high-powered rifles due to lax U.S. gun laws is, I guess, a silver lining. But not really. In the wake of a tragedy like the one in Florida, outrage fuels a lot of the activism. In this case, the activism is also informed, as best it can be, by data and analysis. Guns, and easy access to them, will continue to fuel violent crime. This, to me at least, is something worth getting angry about. 
Much has been said about the teen activists following the murder of their friends. I don't want to dwell on the garbage spewed by the likes of Dinesh D'Souza or Ben Shapiro who look at these young people with scorn. I would sooner amplify the voices of these young people. Oftentimes their arguments are made with a simple passion older cynical adults can no longer muster. Here are some words from Sam Zeif. Um, I was on the second floor in that building, texting my mom, texting my dad, texting three of my brothers, that I was never going to see him again. And then it occurred to me that my 14-year-old brother was directly above me in that classroom where Scott Beagle was murdered. <sighs> Scott Beagle got my brother into class. He was the last kid to get back into that class. And uh, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of you have read my texts on the internet with my brother. I didn't plan for them to go viral. I just wanted to share with the world because no brothers or sisters, or family members, or anyone should ever have to share those texts with anyone. And that's why I'm here. I lost a best friend, who's practically a brother. And I'm here to use my voice, because I know he can't. And I know he's with me, cheering me on to be strong, but it's hard. And to feel like this, <laughs> it doesn't even feel like a week. Time has stood still. To feel like this ever, I can't, I can't feel comfortable in my country knowing that people have, will have, are ever going to feel like this. And, I want to feel safe at school. You know, senior year and junior year, there were big years for me when I turned my academics around, started connecting with teachers, and I started actually enjoying school. And now, I don't know how I'm ever going to step foot on that place again, or go to a public park after school, or be walking anywhere. Me and my friends, we get scared when a car drives by anywhere and I think I agree with Hunter and Huck and how we need to let ideas flow and get the problem solved I don't understand I turned 18 the day after woke up to the news that my best friend was gone And I don't understand why I could still go in a store and buy a weapon of war, an AR. I was reading today that a person 20 years old walked into a store and bought an AR-15 in five minutes with an expired ID. How is it that easy to buy this type of weapon? How do we not stop this after Columbine, after Sandy Hook? I'm sitting with a mother that lost her son. It's still happening. In Australia, there was a shooting at a school in 1999. And you know, after that, they took a lot of ideas. They put legislation together. And they stopped it. Can anyone here guess how many shootings there have been in the schools since then in Australia? Zero. We need to do something, and that's why we're here. So let's be strong for the fallen who don't have a voice to speak anymore. And let's never let this happen again. Please, please.